All right. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for being here for Grand Rounds this morning. Uh, it's noon, so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have an awesome um, group of presenters today that we're really excited to have here. Um, just before I forget, here's some information about CME. Scroll through some of these slides. Oops. Accreditation statements, et cetera. One more information. And here are today's speakers. We'll go through these shortly. And some learning objectives. And I'm gonna share a different screen quickly while I get ready to introduce our warm-up speaker today. All right, so today we have uh, one of our third year residents, um, Dr. Natalia Garza Philpot, who's going to be presenting a Grand Rounds warm up talk on accidental ingestion of medications in children. Natalia comes to us um, from Texas. She grew up in Del Rio, Texas, did a Bachelor of Science in Public Health at the University of Texas at Austin, and got her MD at the University of Texas Health Science Center at San Antonio Long School of Medicine. We're excited to have her here today. And with that, I will turn it over to Natalia. All right, um, thanks for the chance to present today. I picked this topic, um, honestly, after my second year of rotation in the pediatric emergency department, where I saw multiple kids come in with um, ingestions after uh, prescription medications. They have no relevant relationships to disclose. And upon completion of this activity, my hope is that you all will be able to describe epidemiologic trends and pertinent historical background, list the most commonly implicated substances, and be able to discuss with your patients and your family strategies for prevention of accidental ingestion. So to start, um, back in the late 1960s, there was an estimated 300 or so children deaths per year from accidental poisoning. This included all poisoning. Thus, in, the 1970, the in 1970, the Poison Prevention Packaging Act was passed that stated that household substances must be in child-resistant packaging that is significantly difficult for children under five years of age to open within a reasonable amount of time. This pertained to both prescription and over-the-counter medications, with some exceptions. What this meant by a reasonable amount of time was that a child was handed a package and given five minutes, uh, or observed for five minutes to watch if they could open. Um, a, packaging, a packaging pass if uh, more than, or less than 15% of children were able to open the package within 15 minutes. And then the second part of the test was that the child observed an adult open the package and then was given another five minutes to try to open the package themselves. And the package, uh, the packaging was deemed to fail the PPPA if more than 20% of children were able to open it on their own after having watched it be open. So in essence, they were watched for 10 minutes only. The Poisoning Prevention Packaging Act also uh, tried to address unit packaging. The way this was tested is that a child was given 10 minutes with unit packaging. And if a child was able to gain access to more than eight individual units within 10 minutes, that was considered a test fail. Or if the child was able to gain access to whatever number of that individual substance that could produce serious injury, that was based on the weight of an 11 and a half kilogram child about the average weight of a two-year-old. So since the passing of the Poison Prevention Packaging Act, as you can see here, the overall number of fatalities has decreased dramatically. From 1979 to 2006, the poisoning death rate was cut in half, declining from 0.35 to 0.17 per 100,000 children. Yet, among all child poisoning deaths, the number attributable to medications increased from 36% to 64%. In around 2010, about 70,000 children were brought to the ED for unintentional medication overdoses annually. The peak incidence was in two-year-olds. 
this is just another graph sort of describing that um, as we were making some gains in overall fatality, the number of kids presenting for medication-related deaths was increasing. This is a graph out of the CDC's report um, in 2015 that looked at the most commonly implicated substances. And as you can guess and see here, that narcotics was high on the list. Um, rates of emergency department visits were found to be highest for hypoglycemics and beta blockers, whereas serious injuries and hospitalizations occurred most frequently with opioids. Interestingly, studies have estimated about somewhere between, anywhere between 20 and 35 percent of pediatric poisonings involve a grandparent's medication. Um, and then I would be, I would, I don't want to glance over this, although this presentation isn't focusing on opioids specifically. Between the, about, starting about in 2000, 2016, nearly 9,000 children and adolescents have died from prescription and illicit opioid poisonings in the U.S. Their rates of deaths have increased in each of the major sort of groupings of children, but I want to call your attention to children aged zero to four years that have seen a 225% increase. And of all the child deaths, about one third of them was, um, of all the deaths attributed to prescription opioids, about a third of them was associated with methadone. So how do we prevent these things? Prevention strategies endorsed by the CDC have largely come from retrospective review of poison center calls. Um, one notable study was a prospective study inv involving five poison control centers serving the Arizona, Florida, and Georgia areas. The study found that 50% of their prescription medication exposures, an adult had removed the medication from the original container before a child accessed the prescription medication. They also found that adults transferred pills to alternate containers, such as a pill box, in more than one third of the exposures. In a root cause analysis out of Colorado, um, they determined that in most of their unintentional exposures to buprenorphine specifically, that the medication had been stored in sight or left out where the child could see it. The medication was accessed from a handbag or, or a backpack. And again, it was stored in a package other than its original packaging. And we now have studies also showing a link, um, an association with an increased risk of accidental exposure in children, specifically with the use of pill boxes, although it is, um, pillboxes are increasing compliance. So um, around 2010, the CDC Healthy People, the CDC had set um, a Healthy People 2020 objective to reduce emergency department visits for medication overdoses by 10% in children younger than age of 10. This was going from a baseline of about 32.7 per 10,000 children less than five with a target of reaching 29.4 per 10,000 children within 10 years, which was met. This coincided with a decade of the CDC PROTECT initiative, which is Prevention of Overdoses and Treatment Errors in Children Task Force. It's a collaborative effort between public health agencies, private sector companies, and professional organizations, including the AAP, really focusing on development of educational campaign and safe storage messages for the general public, and also enhancement of current child resistant packaging being required by the PPPA. The next target for 2030 is a 35% reduction in AD visits. So briefly, take home points are that accidental ingestion of medications remain a significant cause of morbidity and mortality. Certain medications are more associated with AD visits versus um, significant injury. And education campaigns and prevention strategies have been shown to reduce the number of ED visits within the last 10 years, but have not yet been shown to reduce the number of um, fatalities due to prescription medications. Um, we don't have a great study, retrospect, or a great study on that um, just yet. And here are my references. And then ways for us to get involved, following MD Poison Center on Twitter to sort of just keep your ear to the ground about recent trends, sharing up and away with your patients, family, and friends, 
and really emphasizing to our families that a, about a third of the time the medications involved are a grandparent. Grandparents and then um, saving poison hotline as a contact. Natalia, thank you so much. That was a great start to our grand rounds today. So to continue on today, we're excited to continue our pediatric health equity series. We're going to be talking today about the impacts of COVID-19 on special populations. Um, so we have two speakers that make up our panel today. I'm going to go ahead and introduce them both now. We're going to start with Dr. Burridge, who will speak for about 20 minutes or some time for question, and then Dr. Fields will follow after that. So first we have Dr. Amanda Burridge, who will be joining us from Tuba City, Arizona. We're excited to have her here with us. Dr. Burge completed her medical training at the University of Massachusetts, um, during which time she obtained an MPH from Harvard School of Public Health. She then completed her pediatric residency training at Oregon Health and Science University, followed by a Epidemic Intelligence Service Fellowship with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. She then joined the uh, pediatric team at Tuba City Regional Healthcare Corporation, where she has served as the director of the nursery and the epidemic response team lead during there during the pandemic. She'll be speaking with us today about the effects of the COVID-19 pandemic on the Navajo Nation. Following that, we'll be excited to um, introduce Dr. Errol Fields, one of our faculty here at Johns Hopkins. Dr. Fields began his training in research and public health with an MPH from Columbia University. He then continued his education and training in the medical scientist training program at Johns Hopkins, where he earned his medical doctorate and doctorate in philosophy from the School of Medicine and Bloomberg School of Public Health. He completed his pediatric residency training at Boston Children's Hospital and Boston Medical Center, and then subsequently his subspecialty fellowship training in adolescent medicine here at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. He currently holds a joint appointment in the Bloomberg School of Public Health Department of Health, Behavior, and Society, and as assistant professor of pediatrics in the Division of Adolescent and Young Adult Medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine. He will be speaking with us today about the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on adolescents and young adults. So with that being said, we'll go ahead and start with you, Dr. Burge, if you wanna go ahead and share your screen and we can get started. Thank you for being here with us. Sure, hello everyone. Just gonna share my slides. All right, so my name is Dr. Amanda Burge. I'm a pediatrician here on Navajo Nation in Tuba City, Arizona. And as mentioned, since the pandemic began, I've been leading the epidemic response team for our hospital and our community here in Tuba City. So in the next 15 minutes, I'm going to give a brief overview of Navajo Nation in Tuba City. I'll discuss our COVID-19 epidemiology here, share some challenges with the COVID response in Tuba City, and then explain some of the community impact and community mitigation efforts in Tuba City and across Navajo Nation. So many of you are already familiar with Navajo Nation and Tuba City, but as a reminder, Navajo Nation is located in the southwestern United States. On this map, Navajo Nation is outlined in red, and it covers a large area of 27,000 square miles, which is about the same size as West Virginia. It is in the Four Corners region and extends into Arizona, New Mexico, and Utah. There are approximately 180,000 people who live on the reservation, and roughly 30% of the population does not have running water or electricity. Of note, the gray island in the center of Navajo Nation on the map is the Hobi, Hopi Tribal Lands, a neighboring tribe that also seeks care at some of the Navajo Nation healthcare facilities. So Navajo is divided into five agencies with the capital located in Window Rock, Arizona, shown by the red star on the map. Local governance occurs through chapters by elected officials. Public health on Navajo Nation is led by the Navajo Nation Department of Health, but in reality, much of the public health action and advocacy is conducted at the IHS and tribally run hospital facilities. This is unlike most of the country, which separates clinical medicine, which is run by hospitals, and public health, which is run by the state. In Arizona and New Mexico, state public health departments have little jurisdiction within Navajo Nation tribal lands. 
So Tuba City is located in the Western Agency. It is a border town and has a population of a little over 9,000 people. In all, our catchment area serves about 34,000 patients. While we started planning for COVID in mid-February, we initially hoped we'd have a little additional time to prepare since we are a very rural community. However, COVID arrived quickly and hit hard in mid-March, just as cases were starting to spike in other parts of the country. The first case on Navajo Nation was identified on March 17th, related to a super spreader religious event the weekend of March 7th. Initially, our cases were concentrated in the older population and our hospital was quickly overburdened with critically ill patients. Clinically, we operate a small 73 bed hospital with no intensivists or subspecialists, and therefore our ICU is run by internists. As we quickly became overwhelmed by the severity of disease, we were fortunate to be able to transfer our intubated COVID patients to other parts of the state so these critically ill patients would still receive standard of care, intensive care interventions such as proning, paralytics, and access to clinical trials. At the outset of the pandemic, the per capita infection rate on Navajo Nation was third among U.S. states if we were in U.S. state, only behind New York and New Jersey. And we were 10 times higher than the rest of Arizona. Cumulative case instance still puts Navajo Nation as one of the hardest hits population in the country. So overall, there have been almost 11,000 cases of COVID-19 on Navajo Nation. And of those, um, 1,566 or 14% have been diagnosed or cared for at our hospital in Tuba City. 23% of our cases have required hospitalization and our mortality rate is roughly 5%. The majority of our cases have been among females and 13% have been in um, individuals less than 20 years old. So this graph shows the number of cases by week since the start of the pandemic here in Tuba City, which was calendar week or epi week 12 of 2020. The cases in blue were symptomatic, while the cases in yellow were asymptomatic. As noted, we had an initial spike in cases in mid-March and April, and then a second spike in June and July when the rest of Arizona saw a surge. Since implementation of strict public health orders, such as mandatory 57 hour lockdowns on weekends and universal mask ordinances, the cases have decreased. So there's been another rise in the past three weeks that we're watching closely. This graph shows daily testing volume by result with dark blue for positive tests and light blue for negative tests. The red line represents percent positivity. In the beginning of the pandemic, our percent positivity was as high as 65% and has since stabilized at about 4%, which suggests adequate testing for our population. As we all know, a critical aspect of the pandemic response is mass testing. Initially, we were struggling with test capacity like in other places in the United States, and were only able to test people who required admission. We've since been able to increase our testing significantly thanks in part to the Johns Hopkins Center for American Indian Health and their partnership with CORE. Because we effectively work in a universal healthcare system, testing is free to all our patients, which removes some barriers to testing, though the vast geographic area and transportation provide ongoing challenges. This graph shows hospitalization status of COVID-19 cases. The dark red represents cases that were hospitalized and yellow represents cases that were not hospitalized. Hospitalizations have decreased over time and most infections are now being diagnosed in younger populations that don't require hospitalization. Thankfully, in the past few months, our inpatient COVID numbers have been much lower and we even had a few hours with our, where our respiratory ward was empty. In the past few weeks, our caseload has plateaued, although we continue to see cases often associated with family clusters. In looking at cases by age category, only one patient in the zero to 19 range was hospitalized. Conversely, roughly 70% of patients aged 80 years and older have required hospitalization. So we've had many challenges responding to COVID-19 in our community. As with all hospitals, we've struggled with how to safely change our hospital from an acute care hospital in an ambulatory care clinic to one that could take care of infectious COVID patients. We do this by instituting structural changes to separate high risk and low risk patients. We also have struggled with our PPE supply um, and how to create recommendations given an entirely broken supply chain and conflicting guidelines. Additionally, we've de debated how to manage staff illness and exposures while keeping the hospital functioning, especially since our staff are an integral part of our hard hit communities and families. 
We were also tasked with managing high volumes of very ill patients without prior experience or clear clinical guidelines. Though thankfully, as noted before, we were able to transfer intubated patients to higher level of care to maintain capacity in our facility. We've also been faced with many challenges that are unique to our area, including access to care, lack of electricity and water, poverty, mobile populations, multi-generational homes, high rates of comorbidities and public health needs without coverage from the state or local health departments. <clears throat> so while insurance is not a limiting factor, access to care has been a challenge throughout the pandemic. Many of our patients live on dirt roads and long distances from clinic sites. The Tuba City Service Unit alone covers 6,000 square miles. These long distances from healthcare impact early disease detection and ease of testing. Additionally, riding long distances with family or relatives in a combined space increases the risk of transmission if transmission has not already occurred in the household. In this vast rural community, roughly 30% of Navajo Nation lacks electricity and running water, which likely puts our patients at higher risk for COVID. This equates to approximately 9,600 homes or 37,000 people without piped water on Navajo Nation. Without running water and with hand sanitizer in short supply, hand hygiene is very difficult. Families without piped water have to haul water to their house by personal truck, which means they have to frequently drive long distances to watering points, which increases their risk of COVID-19 exposures. Uh, the median household in Navajo is 20,000 compared to 68,000 across the entire United States. The unemployment rate is estimated at 42% although certainly higher since the pandemic started. And most of these individuals did not qualify for unemployment benefits. Many families lost jobs as a result of shutdowns across the country. And on Navajo Nation, the tribal parks and casinos have remained closed since March. Additionally, the individual economy with flea markets and roadside craft stands and food sales have also been closed since March. <clears throat> At baseline, there is frequent movement across the reservation for employment and to visit family and relatives. Many people who do work, work uh, off the reservation in um, fields such as construction and welding. This can bring them back and forth um, from large cities such as Phoenix or to Texas, Montana, Wyoming, and um, places where they've seen surges in the past months. This mobile workforce introduces additional COVID risks as people who are ill or have been exposed to COVID need to then come home to their crowded multi-generational homes. <clears throat> Navajo people have incredibly strong families and many families live together in small homes where it's not uncommon to have four to 12 plus people from great grandchildren to elders living under a single roof. Often there are multiple family homes on the same compound and there's frequent movement of individuals um, in contact between the houses. As you can imagine, isolating positive patients and quarantining exposed patients is a significant challenge in this scenario. Another challenge is that our patient population has high rates of hypertension, obesity, diabetes, and kidney disease, which puts them at higher risk for severe COVID infection. Across Navajo Nation, roughly 20% of the population has been diagnosed with diabetes. <clears throat> and lastly, one of our largest challenges is that the hospital has had to become a functioning public health department. Since our local county does not have jurisdiction over Navajo Nation, we quickly had to develop processes to do our own epidemiology and contact tracing and simultaneously coordinate with Navajo Nation, the Arizona Department of Health, and CDC without any dedicated public health staff. To put this in perspective, our small epi response team um, takes care of patients, but also keeps track of local COVID numbers, helps train and coordinate contact tracers among medical staff, tries to determine outbreak clusters, works to identify unique risk factors for our population, and collaborates with public relations and community leaders to write public health messages for the community. Thankfully, with our CARES funding, we've advocated to develop a public health department. In the past month, we've hired 10 contact tracers, a data analyst, and a health communication specialist. <clears throat> so what does this pandemic look like for our patients in our community? First and foremost is that nearly everyone has lost a family member to COVID. Since families on Navajo Nation are large and include cousin sisters, clan siblings, um, and god siblings beyond the traditional family, Everyone has been impacted by death and grief, and some families have lost many family members. This grief and the whole uncertainty of COVID have led to significant mental health impacts that we are just beginning to see. 
For the most part, families are still staying home and children are not in school, so these effects are still hidden. It will be some time before we fully understand the extent of the toll on mental health in Navajo Nation. Additionally, the loss, uh, economic impacts of lost jobs, closed businesses, and significantly decreased tourism have had a huge impact on families financially. So locally, we've been working to support families and individuals affected by COVID in many ways. This includes case management with daily phone contact to check in on how people are doing clinically and to identify any needs in a welfare check. Once needs are identified, we can deliver food, water, and hygiene kits. We can also help connect people who identify needs such as livestock food, feed or water, gas, and diapers. We've also been able to provide some support for temporary shelters like tents to deliver to people at their houses. And we can connect people with isolation hotels, though these options are at least two hours away from Tuba City, which can be an added stress on patients. Under the Navajo Nation Health Command Operations Center, I've been helping to lead the community mitigation efforts. Clearly the needs are massive and we have been building participants and efforts over the past few months. Our groups um, include safe ceremonies and sweat lodges, schools, mental health, unsheltered populations, and environmental and occupational health. We've tried to write and review guidelines for schools and businesses across Navajo. We've been working on supporting mental health through identifying assessment tools, sharing public health service announcements, and a day of prayer. These are two examples of guidance that we created in collaboration with a Navajo family medicine physician in Tuba City and medicine man leaders for Navajo Nation. Sadly, one of the recent large clusters on Navajo Nation was connected to traditional ceremonies. And we've learned recently that two of the medicine men passed away as a result of their infections. In terms of schools, um, all the Navajo Nation learning um, has been decided to be remote until January 2021. This has been sort of a difficult decision, um, obviously as it is across the country, um, but especially difficult here, given that many families are, have experienced the grief and are nervous to send their children back to school, especially if they have to come back to multi-generational households. As a result, most districts have provided laptops or tablets. However, there are still major challenges in that many children don't have electricity and many, many don't have internet or web connectivity. So some schools are using paper packets in school buses to deliver and drop up and pick up these paper packets as learning tools. Additionally, the buses are being used for breakfast and lunch support, um, since these are critical needs for these families um, and school is one of the huge resources for food security. And then as part of the community mitigation group, we are developing guidelines um, for reopening um, and safe plans, and then also helping to delineate what should happen in the case of um, COVID-19 cases at schools in terms of exposure and notification. So this was a quick run through of all the different aspects of COVID-19 um, and how it's impacted our hospital, our community. I'm happy to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Burridge. Um, really appreciate having you here to speak. And I, I opened up, if anybody wants to ask any questions, you can feel free to type them into the chat box and uh, we'll, we'll take it. And, Certainly, we'll pause again at the completion of Dr. Field's portion as well. And it looks like there's a question here um, from Amanda Levin. Do you have a culture of use of mask or any pushback? How has that been in Navajo Nation? So actually, mask use has been widely adopted. I mean, it's, it hasn't been a challenge as it has been in other parts of the country and even, even other parts of Arizona. I think it's in large part because people have seen firsthand how severe this illness is. Um, and so people are very adamant and nervous. Um, and so if they do go out, and again, many people are trying to stay home, they are definitely wearing masks. Um, so, the, I mean, still not many businesses in two bar open, but the grocery store um, feels quite safe considering. Great. Another question came in. It seems like COVID has reignited health disparities. Are there lessons we can use moving forward to improve health generally for Navajo Nation? So, I, I mean, I think absolutely. There's definitely been a lot of attention in Navajo Nation um, as a result of how hard we've been hit. Um, I think there have been a lot of efforts um, at addressing the water insecurity. So there's a lot of funding that's being directed towards securing water for homes. However, the like logistical challenges of actually bringing water to these rural houses is 
that is immense. Same with electricity. Um, I think the underlying health issues um, are hard to combat, but people definitely recognize that this population has been hard hit, probably as a result of their underlying diagnoses. Um, but I do think the schooling um, and the opportunities that children have are already um, disadvantaged in many ways. And I think um, it'll be an ongoing challenge. I mean, I think nobody obviously, everyone wants kids in schools, but there's real reasons why they're not in school right now. And so it's, it's a balance. Um, but yes, hopefully things will change as a result of this. And another question was, given the lack of electricity and internet access, have learning pods been created? So that's a good question. Um, I've been on a lot of the school planning calls with school leaders. I have not heard much mention of, of pods. Um, I think, again, people are so nervous to interact with anyone outside their house that um, they're being very cautious. Um, they have, so some school districts have provided laptops and um, Wi-Fi capable sort of devices. Um, but rea the reality is, is that even when people do have Wi-Fi, um, sort of any five-year-old or seven-year-old teaching themselves through Zoom or through packets um, is a, you know, a huge challenge. So I think some places, you know, obviously some families are incredibly dedicated and are doing a great job and some kids are struggling more. They so still have kids where they've given them laptops or tablets and they're not joining Zoom. And so it's unclear why. Um, they have set up hotspots in a lot of the parking lots for chapters and for the, the schools. So um, it's not uncommon for families if they have transportation to drive and sit in the school parking lot all day to use the internet access to be able to join the Zoom classes. Um, so many barriers there. Awesome. And I think we have time hopefully for one more question. Um, the tourism related family businesses may not have had formal organized businesses. Were they able to take advantage of any loans to pay employees or themselves? That's a great question. I don't believe so. I mean, I think most people sort of have their private business, so the unemployment doesn't really apply to them. Um, and I'm not sure sort of how they've been able to access loans. I know that there has, you know, has been CARES money that's come into Navajo Nation and it's still sort of working its way down. Um, there's some that's directed towards medicine men because obviously they've lost some of their income as well and having to um, cancel certain ceremonies and events. Um, but I think everyone is in need. And so how that's being distributed is a big topic. Thank you so much, Dr. Burge. Um, we really appreciate having you here. We'll take a second and pause and we'll um, ask Dr. Fields if he can uh, screen share his slides and we'll transition to hear from Dr. Fields. All right, hold on one second. All right, can everyone see my slides okay? We sure can. Great. So um, as was mentioned, my talk today is the impact of COVID-19 pandemic on adolescents and young adults. And I won't focus on the, the uh, disease itself. Um, I think there's others that are more qualified to speak on the infectious uh, disease aspects of that for this population. But we will fo focus on the following um, learning objectives. So we'll discuss the impact of the pandemic on adolescent and young adult developmental milestones. Describe the increased risk to vulnerable adolescents and young adults imposed by the pandemic and the attendant mitigation strategies. And then we'll illustrate using a couple examples from our practice here, some strategies to support, address the healthcare needs of and maintain care engagement uh, for adolescents and young adults. So I just wanted to start with a reminder for everyone about all the things adolescents must complete before they can reach adulthood. And those things span from the awkward yet amazing physical and biological changes that we see with puberty, but as well, along with psychological and social and cognitive changes. But essentially the major task of the teen years um, is to establish independence, autonomy, and really to figure out who one is. And while adolescents and young adults are less physically susceptible to COVID-19 as compared to adults, they do have developmental risk um, due to disruptions to their daily lives and their social contexts. Um, they can face family disruption due to illness or death, uh, 
along with financial instability from uh, tied to job loss, either from themselves or from their parents or families. And as we know, educational disruptions. And the mitigation strategies and other restrictive guidelines have been put in place around physical distancing, really rightly so to prevent the spread of coronavirus have, have uh, impeded some young people's physical activities or social interactions. And that's really heightened concerns for um, both their psychological and physical well-being and safety. So as I was uh, reviewing some literature in preparation for this talk, I came across a review article by Benner and Mystery, Mystery um, which is really a fascinating review of some of the um, developmental risks that arise um, using uh, life course theory. So life course theory is a useful lens for really understanding the impact of macro level social historical events like COVID-19 pandemic, but also things like 9-11 and the, um, the Great Recession of, of about 10 years ago. Um, and this theory really views human development as a, really as a, a tapestry of intertwined, intertwined, intertwined developmental trajectories, like I was mentioning, biological development, psychological development, social development, um, and that there are really critical transition points. Adolescence is obviously one of those times where uh, things are changing rapidly, one is growing and developing rapidly. Um, and there's also, people's, as you can see here, people are also connected to others during that time. Um, They're linked to others who are also experiencing those um, events. And all of these are really influenced by young people's larger social structures and their social stratifications. And so this paper, they describe really the potential adverse effects of some macro level social historical events on development. Um, they identify some buffering and exacerbating factors and really look at some empiric evidence from both the literature and research that's been done thus far on COVID-19, but also looking back at some other um, large events that have impacted society. So I'll describe a little bit of that. Um, I found it really interesting. So one of these is this impact on developmental trajectories. Um, we know that um, um, that adolescence is a really sensitive and susceptible developmental period uh, and as such they're vulnerable to shocks and insults from the pandemic and from other large um, significant effects events and these can be immediate and short-term effects but they can also have some long-lasting um, repercussions um, so prior pandemics um, uh, such as the SARS and H1N1, which were much briefer um, and didn't have the same level of sort of a global impact that COVID-19 has had, um, ha was associated with higher levels of anxiety, depression, PTSD in children, adolescents, and young adults. Um, and this uh, life course theory really suggests that um, social historical events like this current pandemic can really be turning points that can set into motion sort of accumulating advantages or disadvantages that can impact the long-term sort of trajectories of someone's well-being. Um, so in addition to the studies that looked at SARS-1 and H1N1, this, there's been similar findings um, with the early COVID-19 research finding higher rates of anxiety and depression symptoms um, related to um, concerns around avoiding illness, concerns around school performance and post-secondary pursuits, having to return home from college in the middle of the year, all those things which can be really um, distressing. Um, and this really, um, as an illustration of this impact, this accumulating impact, the authors also cite a study where um, uh, elementary and middle school students' academic achievement declined substantially during and for up to three years following the financial recession of 2008. And so this significant sort of ongoing cumulative effect can really have an impact during a time when development is really crucial and lots of things are developing and changing. So it's also important to be cognizant of the connections that people have. So this other tenet of the life course perspective is the recognition that children and youth and adolescents are not experiencing any of these events, especially not COVID-19 in a vacuum. They're really there navigating this event with those that are around them and there can be really clear be really clear benefits um, of sub having support from families and parents um, even peers and teachers and, and other adults but that support can also be affected or compromised 
um, because those individuals are also navigating the stressors and uncertainties that are of the economic, economic uncertainties as well as pandemic specific um, uncertainties. Um, these may um, impact uh, the um, parent, parent stress and really can undermine family dynamics and family connections. Um, and as an example of this, the authors cite uh, a retrospective study uh, um, of parents diagnosed with PTSD um, uh, during the um, uh, during the H1N1 pandemic. And they found that there were com comparable co-occurrences of PTSD symptoms between parents and children. Um, uh, sorry, this was in relationship to the 9-11 attacks. There's really this co-occurrence of PTSD symptoms if parents had it, the children also had those symptoms. But on the other hand, they found that greater, for instance, maternal acceptance of sort of, of um, uh, acceptance levels pre 9-11 and really helpful discussions between mothers and children and adolescents about the events post 9-11 were associated with fewer PTS symptoms in, the, in adolescents and children. So really that the, the extent to which they can get support and be supported by those that are um, by, those, by their parents and family members and adults can really um, uh, uh, help with some of the stressors they might experience. But we also know that school closures um, not only derail academic trajectories um, and social development, but also can be limit the extent that there are social supports that are available to the most vulnerable, particularly to the most vulnerable youth. Um, and so that's another sort of impact and um, um, deficit that youth who are not able to kind of go to the spaces where they may have gotten the supports they're not able to get in their home environments are subjected to. And this actually speaks to the next uh, um, area that the authors describe, which is the, the social and economic stratification, really that social and economic disadvantages and inequity, some of what we were talking about in the last talk, can really infer greater impacts on the developmental trajectories um, and greater impacts, negatively speaking, for those who are, who are disadvantaged. Um, um, these large events can have a bigger effect than they might have on those who have more resources. An example of this is that racial achievement gaps really widened after the Great Recession, with student achievement gaps declining more in school districts serving higher concentrations of low income and minority students. And certainly data from recent data from COVID-19 pandemic suggests that there have been greater psychological challenges and symptoms among those who are in lower SES families and communities compared to those in higher uh, socioeconomic uh, strata. So the, actually another really interesting survey that just came out um, uh, looks at some of these um, factors as well. Um, and this is a, the teens in quarantine survey where they surveyed about 1500 US teens in eighth, 10th and 12th grades between May and July of 2020. They were really concerned and interested in mental, mental health, uh, family time, sleep, technology use, and, uh, and views on some race related protests that, um, and police violence that occurred during the summer uh, period as well. And they were looking to compare their responses to findings from the 2018 Monitoring the Future survey. So they really set up, use the same questions and set up a similar sampling strategy um, to really see if there have been changes that resulted um, before and then after uh, or during the COVID-19 pandemic. And surprisingly, teens' mental health did not really collectively suffer. Um, as you can see from this graph, the percentage of teens who were depressed or lonely um, in 2020, um, both while in school and out of school, was lower than in 2018. Uh, and while the percentage of those who were unhappy or dissatisfied was only slightly lower, um, they didn't comment on whether that was statistically, statistically significant or not in their report. But really interesting um, findings here. Um, Uh, both before and during the pandemic, though, teens from two-parent families were least likely to be depressed, and so those from one-parent families or other types of families had, were more likely to be depressed. And we know that this is consistent with other research on child well-being and really suggests that teens and two-parent families are more likely to benefit from additional um, attention and financial resources that two parents can invest in, that two parents can invest in adolescents that may not be as uh, available in single parent um, households.
But as you also might expect, mental health challenges were exacerbated um, as, as suggested by the prior study, the prior paper by social and economic disadvantage. As you can see from these two graphs, adolescents who reported disruption in family dynamics uh, or those that reported food insecurity had higher levels of depression compared to those um, who did not experience these, these challenges. And so this, this really, um, there's really, this is indeed evidence of uh, if you have existing vulnerabilities, whether they're social or economic vulnerabilities or physical vulnerabilities, a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic can be, um, can really exacerbate those vulnerabilities and exacerbate health disparities. Um, there's, there's a number of things that you could might describe and think about that might put adolescents at greater risk. Um, some things have been pointed out in the previous uh, papers that I've discussed, but Poverty and economic hardship, child maltreatment and neglect and homelessness is going to be a huge impact on, on adolescents in this time period. Some of the educational um, gaps um, and closures that we've talked about already, intimate partner violence, um, mental health, uh, substance use disorders, developmental disabilities, sexual reproductive health, all these are things that um, can really um, uh, become worsened and exacerbated by um, the conditions that we find ourselves in, especially for adolescents who are particularly vulnerable. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about some of the stuff that we've done here in our clinic, uh, clinical programs here. Um, we, in the spring, um, our group, uh, our uh, intensive primary, the intensive primary clinic, which is the uh, clinic for individuals exposed, affected in living with HIV, um, directed by um, Dr. Agu and Sanders here, um, uh, it's, it's a program here where we really um, take care of youth that are very vulnerable um, and provide a fair amount of wraparound services, not only medical care, but case management, adherence support, mental health treatment, um, and access to resources like food and um, social services and connecting people in those ways. And so you might imagine that a lot of our work prior to the pandemic really involved a lot of in-person um, care both in the clinic but also home visits and helping people figure out and navigate the complexities of being poor in Baltimore and also living with a chronic illness and also developing and becoming an adult. So um, the pandemic really um, and the mitigation strategies really um, affected that significantly. So we um, together our team wrote a paper really describing those challenges and how we try to overcome those challenges to really support our really vulnerable youth. And just as an evidence of the vulnerability Looking at the adolescent age group within that clinic, there are about 76 of them in 2019. 93% um, were non-Hispanic Black, 34% unstably housed, 48% reported having no income, 26% um, of those who are 18 and older had no high school degree, and there are a fair, many, a fair amount of comorbid um, mental and, so, and behavioral health disorders with 32% reporting a substance use disorder, and 54% having depression and or anxiety. So really, um, um, uh, complex and vulnerable population, but a population that actually is, has been doing, has done quite well prior to the pandemic with really great rates of viral suppression and treatment engagement. I think our viral suppression rate at the time was uh, in the high 80s, which is well above the national average. Um, but we uh, really um, were, our, our patients faced a lot of challenges um, with the pandemic. Um, Initially, of the 24 that were employed, 10 of those that were in retail or service-oriented um, um, industries were fired, furloughed, or had their hours significantly reduced, so they didn't have enough money to, to, to pay for rent or other things they needed. Um, those were unstably housed, couch, couch, couch surfing, or, um, or you know, staying with a partner, or staying with friends, or maybe, maybe, even, maybe even engaging in survival sex. Those things were even more challenging and dangerous in the context of um, the shelter in place orders that occurred early in the spring. Our adolescents had limited access to technology and smartphones and Wi Fi and cellular plans, so, sort of engaging them around telemedicine was challenging in many ways. A lot of the worsening of mental health symptoms I described in some of the other papers of our, were, were apparent in our patients um, here. Um, and then less access to some of the relief that younger children or children that are in school or um, are not living on their own might have otherwise had access to, um, including things like transportation and, and food that the schools were still providing to, ch to children who were not, um, when the schools were closed or as the schools have been closed. 
So we looked at um, several sort of areas that had to be changed in our setting because of the pandemic and some of the limitations that we had earlier on described um, in the paper, sort of what we did to sort of um, be able to take care of those um, youth. So with regard to clinical visits, um, as we all know, we had a huge influx of telemedicine visits, which was great for sort of reaching people where they are, but it's also really difficult to reach if you don't have access to that technology. So given some of the resources we have for supporting our patients, we were able to provide them with financial, um, including paying for cell phone bills or giving um, hotspots out, as well as providing phones so that we could support patients um, to, to attend telemedicine visits. Increased our flexibility of when telemedicine visits were scheduled and offered so that um, adolescents could have access to those. Um, and then we had a lot of patients that came in for directly observed therapy um, or for acute mental health needs prior to the pandemic, and that was not really an option initially um, uh, because of the restrictions that were placed on in-person visits. So we really advocated to, for those patients to make sure that they could be seen in those in that under those circumstances. And then case manage is a big component of the work that we do. So our, our, our um, case managers really work to assist patients with navigating some of the complexities. Imagine navigating social services when you can't go into the building, you have to do it over the phone. So really helping them to navigate those services to get access to SNAP and stimulus checks, um, making sure their insurance remain up to date, um, things that can be really challenging to do one on your own as an adolescent sort of kind of figure out how to be an adult, especially in the context of the pandemic with these other vulnerabilities I've described. And then really uh, created a strategy and a system of really regularly reaching out um, to, to patients through phone to check in with them to let them know what's going on, inform them about being safe um, uh, in the pandemic. And that's something that's been ongoing since then. We also um, do a fair amount of mental health uh, support um, with our fabulous mental health therapists and clinicians and social workers. So enhance our social work phone triage to really accept, not even to basically like ask about and then and, and see if there have been some if mental health concerns or a problem with patients if they're not offered um, and making sure that um, mental health appointments were available by telemedicine, which has actually worked for a number of patients who previously were not, um, who were reluctant to engage in therapy. They were more receptive to counseling um, using telemedicine options, which is really um, excellent. And so we also do a lot of uh, delivery of essential resources. I know that happens a lot throughout the, for the different clinics um, for younger children in particular. But really the walk-in restrictions really compelled patients to not come to us as they normally would, but really went looking for resources in the community, oftentimes without access to PPE at that time, which really limited their ability to really be social distance and stay safe. So we got walk-ins approved for food pickup where we would meet people outside of the clinic to provide them with resources. And then also reassign some staff to provide um, home and food, uh, home visits for food and resource delivery. So that's really a lot of what we did for that particular clinic. But um, I also wanted to highlight um, really um, another component of this whole thing. So we know that adolescents, when things are happening and there are big historical events and life changing and societal changing events, that really adolescents are oftentimes the ones that are jumping right in there and making a difference. Um, so we really wanted to focus, I also wanted to talk about how we might focus on fostering resilience and really harnessing community engagement and activism. You can see your pictures from um, of young people really advocating for um, climate change research and attention to climate change. Um, certainly with the, um, the uh, Parkville shooting, um, mass shooting a few years ago, we saw a huge um, kind of uh, uprising of youth um, coming really literally taking to the streets um, to, to, to be engaged and to um, really make a difference. Um, and the, the, the teens in quarantine survey that I mentioned previously, they also looked at um, the uh, attitudes around um, the um, racial unrest and the police violence and killing of, um, of several individuals in the past several months. And really, you can see from these two graphs here that there was a, a real concern about um, police brutality among all races of, of, of people, young people that were surveyed. Um, and then there was a lot of attention and awareness around um, what was going on with lots of folks supporting the protests, being worried, um, having less faith in America. And so um, this, uh, and then people sort of, again, taking to the streets. And so really understanding that that's a, a way of really making you feel equipped to make a change and feel empowered in, in, in times when they may not feel empowered, given all the things that we've seen with the pandemic. 
um, we, I felt it was really important to stress that. And I wanted to really highlight one of our fabulous um, uh, adolescent medicine fellows, um, a second year fellow, Dr. Faith Porridge, who um, is working on a civic engagement project, which she got funded through the Thomas Wilson Foundation, really to uh, promote um, positive youth development by equipping them with the tools to engage um, in their communities. And by one way of doing that during an election year is really by voting. So she secured funding to enhance our, for our discussions of the importance of civic engagement to our patients and really letting them know that this is an important way of getting, getting involved, but also making a difference and taking some power back when you might feel powerless. Um, and to increase voter registration, and voting attention and turnout. I'm just, this is a, a screenshot and a screen video of the, of the website, but you can visit it um, on your own here to really see all the resources that are available to youth. Uh, and that we share with our all of our patients that are um, over 17, over 18 when they come into to clinic. Um, so in summary, um, we know that COVID-19 pandemic has potential for significant short and long-term impacts on adolescent and young adult um, development and their health. And that's particularly true for those youth who are socially or economically disadvantaged. But we also know that adolescents and young adults are incredibly resilient and can really thrive despite many of these challenges. Um, and that in clinical practices, pediatric and adolescent practices, we really can support and promote um, that resilience. Um, so that's all that I have. I'm happy to take um, any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Fields. It looks like there is a question that came in um, through uh, the Zoom of, of how your excellent work is well funded. Uh, um, so, the the funding for the for the HIV um, the IPC clinic is a, it's a we're a Ryan White funded program so that's that provides um, a number of different streams of, of funding from the federal government to support um, uh, adolescents and children that are living with or affected by HIV so that really funds a lot of the wraparound services that have been provided to youth um, in that in that particular clinic and the Thomas Wilson Foundation funded the the work that Dr. Korich has worked on around voter um, engagement and voter registration. So it looks like there is a, a question from Dr. Trent here. Um, I may be, maybe if you want to read it, Dr. Fields, it might make it a little. Yeah, I can definitely read it. So Dr. Trent says, can you talk about the impact of a fair, failure to prioritize adolescent care during COVID-19 without confidential STI screening, patients are coming in sicker, eating disorders and other chronic diseases are no longer under control, overdoses happening with limited options for placement after hospitalization, suicide rates are up, school clinics closed. What are your thoughts about investing in adolescent care over the next six months during perhaps a second wave? I could not agree more. I think there are um, so many, um, with obviously with less clinical resources just by way of having less people in clinical spaces and less in-person visits. And we are earlier in the shutdown really having limited um, access to spaces and, and healthcare for adolescents. We've seen just in our patients and in our consult service, we've sort of seen this eruption of, of some of these um, poor outcomes. So I think it's, I absolutely agree. It's incredibly imperative um, to be able to um, provide um, clinical services and outreach to adolescents um, because they're not they're not going to do well if we sort of forget them and forget their um, their needs during this time period as well which is why I was really trying to illustrate a lot of what we did within our with our really vulnerable population to sort of combat those things but that really needs to happen across the board and um, uh, really investing in ensuring that there are spaces clinic spaces, acute visits, time and opportunity for adolescents to come in to be seen, making use of some of the telemedicine um, strategies that I talked about to really engage youth. I think it's gonna be really important. We found that surprisingly, I actually, most people ask me, um, you know, how's telemedicine with adolescents? And they're actually really great at engaging it. Their phone might be facing their feet, but they're still really engaged at, 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 at with technology and engaging with us and talking with us and, and illustrating, describing their problems. So I think really being paying really close attention to that um, population and putting close attention to their access um, is, is imperative. Otherwise, we're going, to, we're going to continue to see what we've already seen, which is 
um, the poor outcomes that result when they don't have access. Sam, you're muted. Sorry, thanks, Dr. Moon. Just was going to comment. There was a, there was a comment from Dr. Sanders. Great job. Um, I think there are a lot of parallels to how adolescents have been and were treated with the HIV epidemic. Yeah, there's lots of parallels with um, HIV in general, especially around um, health disparities and really the the. I think many of us who do work in health disparities research. We're not at all surprised by the race data that came out that showed these huge disparities in COVID, both um, infections and morbidity and mortality, that the higher impact on African American, Latinx, and indigenous populations in this country. And I think it really illustrates the clear underpinning of racism, um, um, discrimination, um, structural racism in particular, but also biases, um, implicit and explicit biases and individual biases, um, and how those things just kind of repeat themselves over and over again with these types of, these types of illnesses. Um, and, and so I, 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 I couldn't agree more with Dr. Sanders. I think that that really speaks to um, an underlying problem that has to be resolved unless we want to continue to see the same things sort of happen over and over again. Um, and the, the the description of the various impacts of the of social and economic disadvantage from the paper that I described I thought was just really profound because it, it, it's it's borne out and not only um, specific infectious diseases like HIV and COVID-19 but we saw similar things with other with the Great Recession and 9-11 and with other things that have happened large events that have happened over time those who are um, are lower on our hierarchy of advantage do poor, and so we have to um, right some of those disadvantages and, and increase equity in order to really make an impact. And one other comment from um, Dr. Chang, really appreciate your discussion of adolescent engagement and activism, they are our future. Um, Dr. Moon asks for both speakers, how are you encouraging these vulnerable populations to gain some confidence about the future? Yeah, for me, I, I've had a number of conversations with adolescents about voting. <laughs> um, long conversations that some of the residents can attest to that, adoles that have been on adolescent medicine. Um, I've had some patients that are like absolutely geared up. They, they are, are, they are all about it and already signed up and already ready to go. But I've had a number of patients who are, who are literally disenfranchised. I mean, in, in terms of um, just feeling as though their vote doesn't matter, that they don't, can't really make an impact, or they can't really make a difference. And, um, you know, I've, sort of, I've talked a lot to them about the power of their voice. And even if they, they can't be convinced that they have any power over the general election, I really talk a lot about the local election, the local things that can really direct them, directly affect them and how much their voice can have an impact. Even had some conversations with some of the patients about some of the specific questions on the ballot for Baltimore City and how that can have a direct impact on them. And I don't know how much of a move I made, how much I moved them. I mean, one patient just didn't want to be on jury duty, so he didn't want to sign up for, to register to vote. But I think perhaps just continuing to have those conversations and continuing to talk with adolescents about what power they do have and this, this, the excessive power that they do have, I, I think can continue to motivate them. So I think for us, that's a good question. I think voting on Navajo Nation is complicated. I think people have different relationships with federal um, elections. There's Navajo elections and federal elections. I guess this is specific to voting. Um, I will say that we've had flu blitzes recently and there've been incredible turnout. And part of that was sort of asking people if they're registered to vote and helping them register. Um, and almost every single person we asked um, was registered, um, which is great. Um, there were a few interested, but um, I do think people feel connected to this election, perhaps in ways that they haven't um, before. Um, and I, I think otherwise, you know, future, I think the Navajo population is incredibly resilient. And, um, you know, obviously there's a lot of challenges ahead um, in the near and distant future related to COVID, but um, yeah, it'll be interesting to see how, how we, they and we recover. You know, one other, one other thing that I thought I forgot to mention um, you know, to, to the point around how do we really um, um, 
get um, access to care, improve access to care for adolescents. And you know, we have another project here for another fabulous fellow, um, Dr. Silva, um, funded through the Innovation Grant to really to improve access to care through lifts, through actually uh, getting patients to get to clinic. We have a number of patients who feel uncomfortable on the buses and on public transit because those buses have been packed and they're worried about transmission or they're worried about not being able to get in. We also have other adolescents who, because school is not in, don't have their bus passes that they normally would have. And so that's been a resource that we've been able to utilize to get patients into clinic to be seen. Awesome. Well, thank you all so much. It's been such a pleasure to hear from both of you uh, on, on updates um, from how COVID-19 has affected your particular populations. It's really awesome to have you, Dr. Burridge from Tuba City and Dr. Fields from across the street in the Rubenstein building. Um, your insight is, is really valuable and we, we certainly appreciate having you guys. Uh, we will end it here today and thank everyone for joining us for uh, Grand Rounds. Hope everyone has a great day. Thanks everybody, that was great. Thank you. Thank you.